Yada na liyate chitong na chavikship yate punaha. A ninga nama nabha sang nishpan na brahmatatada. When the mind does not merge in the inactivity of oblivion or become distracted by desires, that is to say, when the mind becomes quiescent and does not give rise to appearances, it verily becomes Brahman. When the mind, brought under discipline by the above-mentioned methods, the practice of knowledge and discrimination, does not fall into the oblivion of deep sleep, nor is distracted by external objects, that is, when the mind becomes quiescent like the flame of a lamp in a windless place. In this steady condition, the mind realizes the non-dual Brahman alone everywhere, or when the mind does not appear in the form of an object, when it is seen that the external objects are nothing but the activities of the mind itself, the mind endowed with these characteristics verily becomes Brahman. Namaste. So these, these few verses, the last couple and the next three or four verses, are the summation or the climax of the third chapter of Mandukya Upanishad Karika. And basically, they sum up the arguments by reason for the control of the mind to realize Brahman. So... In these few verses, the entire jnana yoga sadhana is given. Now, notice there's no mention of atma vichara. That's Ramana Maharshi's method. What we're talking about here is actually the same thing from a different angle of vision, a different point of view more of a yogic point of view rather than an ontological or existential point of view. What does that mean? <laughs> it means that instead of becoming attached to samadhi, which is basically running away from your troubles, running away from the suffering of material existence, although that may be a valid step on the path, and it's certainly the uh, end result of Raja Yoga. Still, beyond Samadhi is this state of Brahman, seeing oneself as Brahman. It's not that you can become Brahman, because you already are Brahman. But you are mixing up the mind with the self. That's the problem. That is the meaning of delusion. That is why everybody is conditioned and unenlightened in the world. So the cure for this is simply to recognize the fact, what is, that aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman. And along with this, recognizing the fact that the world and everything in it is simply a function of the mind. I had some friends from Oklahoma. Now, Oklahoma people, if you don't know U.S. culture, are very down-home people very kind of simple-minded and practical, you know. But this was back in the 60s, and these guys were in my band, <laughs> one of the bands I was in. And uh, one time they were tripping on LSD. 
<laughs> or something. And uh, one of them had a hallucination, and he's describing this hallucination to the other one. And after hearing it, the guy said to him, Dude, that's just your imaginary mind. <laughs> It's so funny because Oklahoma people are, you know, how can I say, socially characterized as being kind of dumb. So in other words, you don't really have a mind. You're just imagining that you have a mind. It was hilariously funny at the time. Anyway, <laughs> the whole material existence is just your imaginary mind. Why do I call it imaginary? Because the mind is part of maya, that which does not exist. The proof of it is the mind is always changing, radically. You try to do one thing or think a particular thought, or you sit down and meditate or concentrate on something, and boom, the mind will jump off into some completely unrelated thing and go on and on about it, and you have to drag it back and focus it on the task at hand. Isn't it? This is the mind. But the mind actually doesn't really exist because it's temporary. The mind you have now, or rather the collection of thoughts, because if mind doesn't really exist, it's not a thing. The collection of thoughts in your so-called mind <laughs> right now is completely different than the collection of thoughts you had as a youngster. And when you get old and your body changes, that collection is going to be completely different than the one you have now. So what does all that mean? It's maya. Anything that comes into being also goes out of being. In other words, it's temporary, it's impermanent. Therefore, it's maya. Very simple test. So all these thoughts in the mind are simply illusions, like mirages in the desert. We've been over this a bunch of times, huh? like the snake in the rope. They're just imaginary projections on the world. Pattern recognition. To put it one way, we see something happening out in the world through the senses, and we recognize it as a pattern similar to other patterns we've experienced before. Maybe we even give it a name. Oh, that's a snake. <laughs> but no, actually, it's a rope. We cannot comprehend the world. The world is beyond our understanding because it's created by beings with incredibly superior intelligence and energy. So just forget about trying to comprehend the world. Yeah, maybe we can recognize and categorize and talk about a tiny little piece of it. Huh? But the world is so vast with such a great variety of phenomena and they're coming and going, and sometimes repeating and sometimes not, and appearing in different combinations together, never the same. You look at a, a tree. A tree may have tens of thousands of leaves, but each and every one of those leaves is different. No two are the same. No two snowflakes are the same. It's mind-boggling. But this is the world in which we find ourselves. And the reason it's like that is because it's created with superior intelligence. So we can't hope to actually understand it. For that, for even getting along in the world and functioning and having a smooth and uh, auspicious life, we have to depend on those higher powers. We have to take shelter of God and pray. 
we have to do sacrifice and offerings. That's karma yoga. And in time, grow to love God. That's bhakti yoga. Then when we acquire wisdom, raja yoga, we can see that this world is simply an illusion, a very sophisticated illusion, but still an illusion. And then we can gradually remove all of these illusions from our mind, so to speak, our imaginary minds, and come to the understanding that actually everything is consciousness. Sarva Kalvidam Brahma. Everything is Brahman. Everything is consciousness. Nothing is real. So try to understand and then take the next step. If nothing is real, then why should my mind be agitated about it? Why don't I see everything as simply Brahman? Because that's the truth. It has always been Brahman. It's not that it becomes Brahman when you think about it. It's always been that way, always will be that way. So the temporary appearance of the creation is only something that we see when we're in conditioned consciousness. It's only like the snake. We only see the snake when it's like dark out or we forgot our glasses or we're drunk or something. Actually, it's a rope and it's always been a rope and it's not going to change just because we see it differently. Well, it's the same with the world and the self, because the world is nothing but the self. It's nothing but consciousness, seeing through the lens of the mind, the thoughts and the identifications and patterns and so on that we think of as reality. But it's only because we think of it that way. It's not real. It can't be real because it's impermanent, see? So we can go back and forth over this same circle of reasoning again and again, but this is basically the argument in this chapter of Mandukya Upanishad. If the world as we see it is only an epiphenomenon, in other words, it's something that we mistake as something else, like the snake and the rope, then the cure for this is to simply ignore it. So this method that's given, this aslesha yoga or asparsha yoga, simply means to recognize this fact Maybe in the beginning, sitting in a quiet place and all that is helpful for recognizing all these things and priming the mind in a certain way with uh, reading these shlokas or whatever. But ultimately, we should be able to maintain this mental composure even in the midst of all the phenomena of the material world. Because after all, they are only Brahman. They've never changed. So even though, yes, there is a time and place for disciplined thinking, meditative thought, and like that, still the ultimate test of all of that is if we can maintain this state of mind that everything is Brahman, even in the midst of activity and the normal ups and downs of everyday life. When we can do that, then we know that we have achieved the highest enlightenment. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.